all the way to the right. Ooh, Myrtle Avenue is turning up on Myrtle all the way down on your right is a little bit. They are good practice. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's around. Mm -hmm. I gotta go. Still at the Larry's Auto, my gas. I just So um, I work at a company called Google Extension, and they actually contributing emails telling people not to use chat, uh, chat GPT in any of the coding roles. They're specifically saying this is a problem if our clients catch us doing this. So you are not allowed to do that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You're always talking about like, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you know, an issue of if the, the, the robot can basically do anything you want to do with the AI or whatever. And yeah. I'm just wondering how many companies are actually going with that policy going forward, or if that's just an. That's interesting. Thing. That is very interesting. Did they tell you why they have this this policy? No. They, they just basically distributed the email to everyone in the technology brand saying, don't do it. Oh, yeah, okay. It's because we serve a bunch of clients and yeah. Yeah. we're not really supposed to use third party tools in general. I see. Well, anytime you're using a compiler, it is a third party tool. So. Unless you guys develop your own compiler. <laughs> All righty. All right, so I'm going to go get started here. Um, I will not use class time to talk about the solution of the exam. Uh, I talked about it a little bit after the exam, you know, on Thursday, last Thursday. Um, but if you guys want to kind of want an explanation of the answer and, you know, I can do it in a video or I can just give you the key that is specific specific to your exam because i got the script to actually generate um, question or individual exam specific answers i mean how else am i going to grade it <laughs> i mean i can probably grade it you know, manually without the key but it's handy to have the key also okay so what we'll do today is we are going to continue uh, let me Oh, I need to make sure that we are doing a screen share because otherwise there won't be a recording. That would not be good. So let me do a screen share first and then we'll go ahead and get started. So this is desktop two. Here, there we go. All right, so it is recording. Everything is good. All right, so what we'll do today is we are continuing to talk about the double precision floating point format, but now we're going to focus on the conversion. In other words, if somebody gives you a base 10 scientific notation, how do you convert that into a double precision floating point number representation in base two? Okay, so you might think, well, this is not a very useful thing to do. Well, it depends, okay? Because if you think about you know, how many people know what is an, an Arduino? It's a very small embedded system. You know, it has an 8-bit processor running at, I think, at the most 16 megahertz. Yes, you heard me right, 16 megahertz, which is a very, very small fraction of a gigahertz. Um, so in that case, they do not have a built-in floating point unit, which means it cannot handle double or floating point number calculations in hardware. Everything in hardware is integer based and it's only 8-bit, okay? It's an 8-bit processor. It cannot even handle 64-bit addition, you know, in one single shot. It has to break up a 64-bit addition into eight 8-bit eight additions. So you can kind of imagine you don't have a whole lot of horsepower or processing power to begin with. So when you enter a number in base 10, like, oh, this is my number 1.23E45, okay? Um, it has to store that number, which is in base 10 representation, in a double in order to do calculations or just to store it for logging purposes. So the question is, 
um, how do we do this conversion? Now, if you think I can use log and you know, you know e to the power of something and the power function, yes, you can. But then your computer, I mean, your, your calculation will be really, really slow because you know that processor was not built to deal with floating point number representation. So what we'll do today and possibly next class is to talk about that. Okay, is to talk about how do we. Just to, to do the conversion, we are not even doing calculations. We're just doing a conversion from base 10 scientific notation to store into a double representation. So do we have any questions before I move forward with that particular direct, in, the, in that direction? No questions? All right, well, let's go ahead and move forward. And in case you're, you're a little worried about you know, not being able to finish the exam on Thursday, what I, would, what I would do is to take the sixth or the seventh year highest score of the entire class and consider that the new 100% and then scale everybody up. And then after that, I will take a look at the distribution. And if, still, if I still have a lot of people going like, mm, that's a really kind of horrible score, I might consider taking the square root times two, you know, maybe something along that approach. So what that would do is to preserve the relative positioning of everybody. So if somebody, if person A had a higher score than person B, it's guaranteed that order will, will, will still be preserved. But what it did, what, we, what it would do is to increase the number of points in terms of percentage, the most for the people who get the lower score. Okay, so that's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a curving technique, you know, but it's, it favors you know, people with a lower score, except the people who get a flat zero, because no matter what you do, you know, the flat zero will still translate to a flat zero in that case. So don't worry too much you know, about the exam and we can, you know, hopefully focus on the new topic. <clears throat> We're pretty close to being done with how data is represented. Then we can move on to the actual processor portion. So let's go back to floating point number representation. And I'll give you guys an idea of where we are at. So what we'll do is we'll first talk about the base 10 scientific notation. And let me zoom in a little bit first because you know, I just want you guys to be, to look at this and go like, what is that? Now, obviously, I hope that many of you have already read the material and have some idea of what that is. Oh, it's regular expression. So, or known as regex, R-E-G-E-X. R-E-G -E -E is regular and an E-X is expression. How many people have heard of regular expression? We got about three people understanding what is regular expression. It's a very useful tool, and every one of you will be exposed to regular expressions at some point in the next two years or so, because when you transition to a four-year university, there should be an upper division class called the theory of computation or you know, automata, you know, theory of computation, that sort of stuff. And they will talk about Alan Turing. And Alan Turing was the computer science, you know, the father of modern day computer science. And um, the regular expression is the simplest language that a finite state automata can recognize. I can only tell you that much without using too much time of this class, okay? So let's take a look at this representation here because I do want you to have some exposure even though it is not directly related to um, CISP 310. I'll go a little bit fast in this case because I'm not gonna test you on regular expression, but I do want to get you some exposure to this whole thing. All right, so I'm just gonna highlight the whole thing. This portion, you know, anything that is in square bracket would be um, our alternative characters, okay? So in this case, when I have open square bracket plus minus uh, n square bracket, what that means is at this position, we can have a plus or a minus. The character can be either one, is that okay? So all that is specifying is, uh, we can have a plus or a minus. The next symbol is a backslash equal to, and that basically means whatever is immediately before is optional. We can have zero or one occurrence 
of whatever is right before the backslash equal to. Okay. So we call the backslash an escape character because you know many times you want to use equal as a part of the string that you're matching. So backslash equal to means you know has a different meaning. It basically is telling you telling the uh, finite state machine we want exactly one or zero of whatever is before. So that means the sign of the entire thing is optional. You can specify plus 1.23 E45. E you can specify negative 1.23 E45, or you can just say 1.23 E45. They're all acceptable. Is that okay? All right. And then we move on to uh, square bracket again. This time it is square bracket 1 dash 9. So you can use the dash um, operator to specify a range. So this basically, okay, I cannot, I cannot seem to highlight the, the portion that I do want to, oh, okay, I guess now it works. So this is specifying the next character would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, but only one of them. So we can have one single character from one to nine. Is that okay so far? All right. And then the next portion is a little bit more confusing because it, it uses parentheses. It uses what we call a group. So this is the beginning of the group and this is marking the end of the group. So grouping means you know, we can now treat the entire group as optional, which we'll, I will explain later. But what is inside the group? The first thing is backslash dot. Backslash dot is escaping the dot, which has a special meaning. I'm not gonna talk about it, but backslash dot literally just means, oh, this has to be a period. This has to be a dot. Okay. And then we have backslash D. Okay. Backslash D is also escaped. It means any digit from zero to nine this time. So I cannot use backslash D over here because I do make sure want to make sure this one is not a zero. But over here, I can use any digit from zero to nine. Then the asterisk right after that. Is not escaped, but it nonetheless it specifies something special. It basically specifies that whatever is immediately before the asterisk can occur any time, zero or more times. So that means I may not have a single digit here. I may have a whole bunch of digits here. They're all okay as long as I have zero or more base ten digits. It will satisfy that requirement. All right. And then after that, for the entire group, okay? So now we go back to the outer scope. We look at the entire group here. So this entire group is once again followed by backslash equal to, which means we can have zero or one occurrence of the entire group this time. So that means one E45 is perfectly fine as a you know, scientific notation in base 10 without, you know, the decimal part. But if you want to specify 3.14 E0, hey, that's fine too. Yep. Um, so the, if the backslash equals means that everything that comes before could have could be there or could not be there pretty much. It's zero or yeah. one occurrence. Uh, but it's not because of that, it means that you couldn't possibly have like a positive sign and then not have anything in the next part. So the positive sign you mean at the beginning here? Yeah, because it's before it equals, but then once you get to the second equals, it's kind of like everything before it treated as a it zero. is whatever is the entire group immediately before it would be referring to the group, the entire group. If I did not have a group, then it would be whatever character I specified. But since since I used backslash open paren and backslash close paren, whatever backslash equals is dealing with now. Is the entire group. It is not a single character. So, this is a, a bracket, another bracket, or a group is no, nope, this is the beginning of a group, and this is the end of the same group. But that was, well, this is not a group. This is, yeah. these would be alternative characters. Ah. It specifies a single character position, but it also specifies what can go into that one single character position. Choose one. Basically, this is choose one character inside the square bracket. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So at this point, you know, we also have an open parent here and matched by this closed parent over here, which also means we have another group. So within, within this group, this E is verbatim. In other words, it has to start with a lowercase e. Okay, the lowercase e is separating the mantissa part from the exponent part. So this e has to be here. After that, once again, we have plus minus, which means that the exponent can have an explicit sign, but the explicit sign is also optional because this entire thing is optional. This specifies the plus minus is optional. After the sign, which is optional, it is no longer optional that we have backslash D followed by backslash plus. So the only difference between a backslash plus and an asterisk is with an asterisk, it means zero or more occurrences, which means zero occurrence is perfectly okay. Backslash plus means one or more occurrences. So that means you have to have at least one occurrence of whatever is before the backslash plus, which is a single digit, base 10. So this entire thing, okay, from the open paren of the group that we are currently talking about from here, all the way up to here, is specifying the exponent of 10 when you specify a scientific notation. But that entire thing is also optimal because you can see the backslash equal here that is applying to the entire group here. Is that okay? So that means one is perfectly okay as an acceptable base 10 scientific notation. One E zero is perfectly okay. One E minus zero is okay. Minus one E minus zero is okay. If you want to be redundant, plus one, is fine. Plus one e plus one is fine. One plus uh, plus one point zero 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 e four is perfectly fine as well. Is that okay? Yep. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the last two sets of uh, backslash for for the or like the one right before I guess the group n uh, right between uh, the d and the group n. Uh, what that one was for. You mean this one? Yes. That means uh, one or more occurrences of the thing right before. Okay. So in this case, it means you, know, you have to have one or more base 10 digit after the E. So when you look at this thing here, go like, what kind of crazy people would use a regular expression? It looks so remote and so useless. Well, the answer is, anyone who has to validate data entry in a form. So we are talking about people who process the result of a web form, okay? You, know, you submit a form with your name, your address, your zip code and stuff like that. The person who's writing the code to validate that data to basically say, is that even a valid you know, social security number? Is that a valid phone number and so on? That can utilize regular expression. So this is not even computer science. This is just your know, data entry validation. Um, it looks awful, you know, because you know it, it 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 doesn't have a lot of special characters to to use in order to specify one of those things, or at least one of those things, or any number of those things, or zero or one of those things. But the concept is very very important. Okay. So do we have any questions about you know, regular expression? Yep. Yeah. Well, you're looking at one. <laughs> huh? Is that? Okay, so let, let me see. I think this is VI also com, uh, com, com, compliant. So maybe I can illustrate an example of how this works. We can give it a try. I'm not 100% sure whether it is uh, VI compliant or not, because there are different families of regular expression, and this is one of those. So let me uh, give it a try here. All right, so what I will do, and then, and what I'll do is I'm going to enter a bunch of numbers. Some are valid and some are not valid. So I'm going to enter 1, 1.1, 1.1E1, 1.1E without the 1, E1 without the mantissa, 
uh, plus one, plus 1.1, plus 1.1 E1, uh, plus 1.1 E minus one. <laughs> you guys can see kind of you know, where I'm going here, right? Um, and then we can you know, try something that does not work, okay? Like 0 0.2 E5, um, that should not work, okay? So now that I have entered all of these things, I would use the slash command in VI, which is search, and then I will enter that pattern, okay? Plus, minus, close. And you can see how VI is really kind of cool. Um, it immediately does the match. So what I would also do in this case is to make sure I start the match from the beginning of the line, which is a carrot symbol. So we have plus, minus, close here, square bracket. So these four are matching right now. And then we do a optional. And now you know, a whole bunch of, you know, of uh, the characters light up. And then we specify one to nine you know, bracket. So now we are recognizing more characters. And then we have backslash open uh, paren. Inside we have backslash dot, backslash D, asterisk, backslash, you know, close paren. So you can basically see how much it is recognizing as I add more to the regular expression. So this one, okay, so this little experiment is even more fun when you watch it in the video because you can stop, you can pause, okay? And you can basically match what is highlighted in the editor with the actual regular expression. Then you can understand which portion is accepting or recognizing which part of each line of the text. All right, so we're gonna start with, um, hmm, the plus one is not being recognized. That is kind of strange. Hmm. The, on line six, okay, line six you know, should be recognized because it has a plus, and then it also has a one. You haven't made the yeah. dot. Oh, I haven't made that optional. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I just answered my own question. Good. All right. So now we can now specify the exponent portion. You can see how E1 is not highlighted. E1, you know, uh, E minus one is also not recognized. Uh, so now we will try to handle that part. So we'll use backslash open again to begin an entire group, lowercase e, that is mandatory, plus minus, choose one of those, but the entire thing is optional to begin with. And then backslash d, which is a zero to 10, excuse me, zero to nine digit. Um, this time we need to have at least one and then close that group and then call the entire group optional. So there we go. Yep. Uh, wouldn't this cause some issues if you had like a, a exponent raised to a multiple power or a multiple digit power? So like, it would not be a problem. Uh, because you don't have the D on the exponent as being able to be repeated. So like, it is the, the backslash plus is a repeating. Okay. It, it's it's the same thing as a as an asterisk except one starts with a zero, the other one starts with one. So backslash plus means you know at least one of the thing immediately before. So that okay. means at least one base 10 digit, but you can have as many as you want. Okay. Yeah. So this would accept anything that is normalized. As long as the mantissa is normalized, it would be okay. Is that okay? So once again, this is kind of like a freebie, okay? Because you know I'm not gonna test you guys on regular expression. But it does illustrate how useful regular expressions are in terms of you know, being able to validate you know, some kind of input. Um, this is not by far the most complicated thing you can do with regular expressions because you can actually, uh, this is only search, okay? You can use regular expression in conjunction with replacing stuff. Then you can basically say, this group goes here, this group goes here, and then the rest is gonna be rearranged like this. So you can actually do a lot of fun stuff with uh, regular expression. It cannot count parentheses. Ne things cannot be nested. That's the problem. Uh, they can be nested as long as the level of nesting is static, but it cannot be recursive. So um, that's because this belongs to what we call a finite state machine, you know, which is a, the lowest class, the simplest type of um, automata in uh, Turing's theory. Um, if you want something that is infinitely stackable or nestable, then you need what we call a push-down push down acceptor, 
which is kind of like a finite state machine, but it has this built-in stack concept. So you will, you will see all of these concepts again when you take that class in a four-year university. Um, and I hope some of you guys will be interested in that particular subject matter because it is really kind of core to computer science. Question? Nope. Okay. All right. So that's just my little demonstration. Um, it's not, once again, this is not super duper important, but it is kind of, I mean, it just, I just want to find excuses to help introduce you know, additional concepts into this class. All right, so with that said, okay, so first thing first, if this is the syntax of a base 10 scientific notation, and I ask you to write a parser, which basically means you, know, you are given a string that may or may not conform to this format. And I want your, I want you to write the code to validate. Would you be, would you guys be able to do that? Just say yes. For the record. Okay. <laughs> so for the record, the entire class said yes. <laughs> yes. Because that is important, okay? Because this is basically just using conditional statements, loops, and being able to go back and forth in an array of characters, okay? So your next actual assignment, not a lab activity, is to write a program. And the first part of the program is to parse the input, which is a base 10 scientific notation according to this particular syntax. So if you are thinking, oh no, you know, I have to write C code to do this sort of thing, you don't have to do it. Yes. Uh, you can recurse with regular expressions. You can? Yeah. Hmm. Then how do you refer to the groups? Um, you use a like a question mark and then a letter for for two groups. It's um, it's a named group. As of like twenty fifteen, I think this is this is like a relatively recent feature. Oh, way. okay, I see. Okay, and it's only in some implementations, but it it does exist in Perl, <laughs> Python, uh, a bunch of other stuff. In Perl, you said mm -hmm. that's interesting I too. Stuff like Perl. Yeah, because I think you know, very few people in this class has even heard of the programming language called Perl. And it is not P-E-A-R-L, it is P-E-R-L. It is written by a single person um, and Perl programmers are typically called monks, M-O-N-K-S, monks, because you, you need that kind of discipline to really program in Perl. They have annual competitions of who can write the most difficult to understand code in Perl. In some programming languages, it's not, it's actually really hard to make code difficult to understand. In Perl, you don't even have to try. Yep. Huh? No, it's just a very interesting language. It combines a lot of features from, you know, uh, from EX, from um, Grep, from Awk, you know, all of those, you know, text processing tools that are built into Unix slash Linux, it roll all of those things into one. It borrows certain elements from Bash, uh, the born again shell. It borrows certain elements from C and C++. It has a very special way of doing object oriented programming. You create a hash, which is, you know, to some of you, you know, it as a dictionary or a, um, what is the other name for that? You can also call it an object, depending you know, because in JavaScript is called an object. So the only difference between something that has a class and something that does not have a clinical class associated with it is whether it is blessed. Bless, B-L-E-S-S, -E -S, is an actual keyword in Perl. And that is the main thing that you can do object-oriented programming is to bless an object. I'm not kidding. You would think that I'm just kidding, and I'm not, because I used to program in Perl for a long time, and then I switched to PHP, and then I quickly switched again to Node.js, because I couldn't stand PHP. You don't want to program in a programming language where they periodically um, deprecate features to the point that your old programs would fail, would crash, would stop working, like all together. Yep, that would not be good. So anyway, 
This code is already written. So if you're kind of worried about having to write a parser, don't worry, it's already done. So the focus of this class is the math portion, okay? So we'll, we'll kind of move forward to talk about the math portion, okay? All right, so we are moving forward. And what we are looking at here is we are starting off with a the, we want to preserve the value, okay? Whatever the bit pattern and the base 10 digits are representing, we want to preserve that as much as possible. So the sign, we know what that is already. You know, if the sign is uh, a one, then we multiply with negative one, otherwise we multiply with one. So in the base 10 version, the coefficient in base 10 times 10 to the power of the exponent of 10, that specifies the value that we want to represent. So the first portion, is you know a scientific base 10 notation where you have the coefficient, which when it is normalized, it is called the mantissa, but then we want to convert it into base two. So the way we convert, convert it into base two is somehow we have to find a C2, which is the coefficient in base two, and it has to be multiplied by two to the power of the two's exponent. So we have to find C2 and also E2 so that we are representing the same value or to the best ability that we can. Is that okay? So you're given C10 and E10, and somehow we have to find C2 and B2. And both of those, okay, C2 and C10 are both unsigned integers, and then E10 and E2 are both signed integers. Are we good so far? So that's going to be our objective. This is what we want to be able to accomplish. And we want to be able to accomplish this without the use of any double precision operators. So we only want to use integer arithmetic. So we want to use integer addition, integer division, integer subtraction, integer comparison, integer multiplication, and so on. Okay? Are we doing okay so far with the setup of what you guys need to do? Okay, all right. So basically the first thing, the first challenge is to get rid of the decimal point. So to illustrate that point, let me, hmm, I'm just thinking you know, what would be the best tool to illustrate it. I think I'm just gonna use mouse pad in this case. Because you know, I don't really need a scientific notation. Well, I do, but it's it's going to be okay. All right. So let's just say that we have a number of one point two three, and okay, I have to look forward a little bit um, because I need to come up with an example that is consistent with. Okay, so we want a negative exponent. Okay, there we go. And we can bump up the font size a little bit because I think this one is a little bit small. Uh, there we go. Is that better for the people in the back? Can you guys still see the, the digits? Okay, all right, excellent, thank you. So we are, let's say we are looking at you know, 1.23E12, okay. So you know this is a valid base 10 scientific notation because we are starting off with one point two three, and then the exponent of the of in base ten is um, the exponent of ten. I should say is negative twelve. So we know what this value is. We know what it is representing. The question is, how do we store this value as a base two scientific notation or you know, double precision um, representation? So the first thing we need to do is to say, well, tech, there's no way we can do this without using double because the mantissa itself is a double. So I'm gonna throw in a trick here, okay? So I'm gonna say, hmm, if you look at this number here, it really is the same thing, okay? So the equal equal is intentional here because I want to establish that these two values are the same. So it really is the same thing as one, two, three, 123 times 10 to the power of negative 10. Okay, is that right? This is something that we did last Tuesday. Is that okay? Because 123 is 100 times 
but somehow I have to adjust. Oh, I think I got it wrong. It should be going the other way. Yeah. See the when I, as I reason it out and go like, no, I went the opposite way because I have to decrease the power of 10 in order to make up for the coefficient being multiplied by 100. Is that okay? But hey, I found a way. I found a way so that I don't need to use double or float to represent the coefficient. Is that okay? So we got our C10 and our E10. Does that make sense? In other words, at this point in time, we can say C10, which is the coefficient in base 10, is 123. And then E10, which is the exponent of 10, is negative 14. Are we good? Okay. So we can also say, you know, um, E2 is zero at this point because we can always say, hey, we can multiply this whole thing, which is 123 times 10 to the power of negative 14. We can always multiply that whole thing to, with, uh, to two to the power of zero, because two to the power of zero doesn't do a single thing. So we can always assume that E2 is just zero. It is not, not there. It is simply a value of zero. Are we good so far? All right. So the objective is to make E10 get to zero, okay? We want this to go to zero. So you might say, so how do we do that? One step at a time, baby steps, okay? Let's see how we can make E10 go to negative 13. But then you will say, but Tech, we, we have been there already. Because if we get E10 to 13, then the coefficient 123 will have to become 12.3. Uh, and we cannot store 12.3 as a integer or unsigned integer in this case. So you're correct, we cannot do that. And if we did, we would have a problem, okay? Because if you say, you know, if you look at 123 and you divide it by 10, now, if this is an integer division, it will give you 12. On the other hand, if you look at 123.0, which makes it a float and divide that by 10, you get 12.3. In other words, the integer division is gonna lose 0.3 out of 12. There's a certain error associated with it. Is that okay? All right. Well, I'm, I'm asking, is that okay? Meaning that do you understand the concept of integer division is not nice because it's losing precision. Okay, we're good, all right. So let's see what happens when we multiply 123 by some powers of two before we do the you know, division by base 10. So I'm just gonna try out, you know, maybe by four, okay? So 123 times four is what, 48, four, nine, two, I think. That looks right to me, okay. So, um, and I can make up for the multiplication, multiplication by, you know, by four, because I can now say, eh, we'll just make E2 equal to negative two to counteract the multiplication by four. Are we still doing okay so far with the approach? Okay. All righty. So now we look at this question. And what does E2 represent? E2 is the power of two. So this is where E2 is coming from right there. So in between, you know, we are, you know, we will have E2 and E10 coexisting at the same time. So basically V, the value that we want to represent is always stored as a product, as a coefficient, which is kind of mixed, okay, sometimes, times two to the power of E2, times 10 to the power of E10. So E2 and E10 can be non-zero at the same time, but as long as two to the power of E2, times 10 to the power of E10, times whatever this C is, the coefficient, turn out to be V, we are still okay, because the idea is we want to preserve the value being represented. Is that okay? So I can change C, I can multiply C by four 
as long as I decrease e2 by 2, then the, the value is still preserved. Is that okay? Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. So, but why would I do that, right? I mean, you know, what is the whole point of doing that? So let's go, go ahead and check out why we are doing that. So now we are looking at 492. And let's say we want to do an integer division. It is 49 because we basically just lose the fractional part when we do a, a, a integer division. But the actual value, okay, if you look at the um, actual division of you know, 10 from, uh, if you look at the actual result of 492 divided by 10, it is 49.2. Do you think the error of 23 in 12 is larger or smaller than 0 0.2 in 49? It is larger. So if I multiply the coefficient by a power of two, the more I multiply and then division by 10, the less error I'm going to experience. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. So that's what we'll do. We are, we are basically going to maximize the coefficient before we divide it by 10, because we cannot avoid the division by 10, because that's the only way to bump the exponent of 10 up by one, is to have the coefficient itself to be divided by 10. Is that okay? So the division by 10 is inevitable but we can minimize the damage of the integer division by making the coefficient as big as possible. And then we say, okay, with this really big thing, which, is, which has 19 base 10 digits in it, we'll divide it by 10. Yes, we're gonna lose something, but it's not gonna be that significant anymore. Is that okay? So now our objective is to make C, the coefficient, as big as possible, as large as possible. So now the question is, uh, what do you mean by as large as possible? So in this specific case, we are looking at 123 and we are asking this question. We want to multiply 123 by some power of two, we'll call it two to the power of P. And we want this P to make sure that whatever this thing is would still be less than you know, whatever the max is for the format that we have chosen. So for instance, if we have chosen to use a 64-bit unsigned integer for the coefficient, then this max is going to be what? What is the largest value of a unsigned 64-bit integer? I don't need you to spell out the digits because it will be kind of long. There'll be 19 digits. I just need you to tell me how do we find it? What is the formula to calculate it? Yes. Raise the power of 64 plus one to 65 subtracted by one? No, it's just you, you, you have the extra uh, plus one. So it's really just two to the power of 64, the whole thing minus one. This would be the largest value you can represent as an unsigned 64 bit integer. Because you only have 64 um, bits, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you make them all ones, then it would still it would still not be two to the power of sixty four. It would be two to the power of sixty four minus one. I, I was forgetting about the zero bit because that yeah uh, bit zero yep. yeah bit zero goes so it goes from zero to yep. uh, for each of the four yep. powers. So we want to find this p. Okay, we want to find the integer p so that you know one hundred twenty three times two to this power of p would be barely less than two to the power of 64, the whole thing minus one. So how do we find it? Some of you can whip out the calculator and say, I can use log to help, right? Because that would be the easiest way to find out what this P is. Unfortunately, remember what I said, I want to do this whole thing without using log and all the higher math stuff. I want to do this only using, um, comparison, integer comparison, integer division, integer multiplication, and so on. So how do we find this P? Uh, can we divide out, let's do like a while with uh, dividing out one, two, three by two in integer division until you reach like zero one 
and you usually track the exponent as you go? So like um, yes. So um, that would be the approach. That is the correct approach. But the question is, how do we set up the loop? Okay. So that means, you know, I can set up the loop like this while I will say there is room for another times two. Do the actual times two. Okay. So the coefficient is going to multiply it to itself by two. And then for those of you who say attack, multiplication is expensive. Let's not do that. Fine. We won't do that then. What is that? What is C plus equal to C? What does that do? It doubles, right? It's the, it has the same effect as multiplication by two. Plus equal to, multiply equal to, divide equal to, and then minus equal to, those are called compound assignment operators. In other words, they are like assignment operators where they would change the left-hand side, but they are basically a shorthand of using the left-hand side also on the right-hand side before the operator, before the non-assignment operator, I should say. So in this case, it would be the same thing as saying C equals two, C plus C. Okay, I'm just gonna, <clears throat> I'll be nice and give you the comment. It, it does exactly the same thing. So how many people knew that already? It's like, yeah, I knew that. I just don't use it very often. Okay. You use it? Very good. Okay, but it's important. Even if you do not want to use it, even if you think this is actually more difficult to understand, you still need to understand it. Because when you start off as a software engineer, do you think you'll be starting up new code and the company is going to say, you know, hey tech, you know, I want you to write a brand new operating system and it's just going to be your code. Yeah. That won't happen for at least another 15 years. So what you'll be doing is you are going to use a toothbrush to clean up the code that somebody wrote 30 years ago. <laughs> and who knows what type of notation that person had been using, right? And it's just not one person. If the program is 30 years old, it probably was touched by 20 people-ish, at least. <laughs> Each person has a slightly different programming style, so you'd be looking at a combination of programming style, commenting style, ways of naming variables, and so on. So that means it is important for us to understand how to read the code. Even if it is a format that you don't plan to use, it is still important to understand how to read it. All right, so every time we do this, we have to also say, hey, if we're doubling the coefficient, we better be decrementing the exponent of two by one. Does that make sense? So by, do, by doing these two things, we are preserving V, the value that we want to represent. Is that okay? Doubling the coefficient and then decrementing the power of two. By doing these two things in the same iteration, we are preserving V. This is not a problem. This is the easy part. The difficult part is to specify how do I know there is room for another multiplication by two? That is the question. It's like, hmm, I wonder why. Well, that is actually fully explained in the text of the module. So I would defer that to the module to explain that to you. If you cannot understand the module or how I was explaining that by next time, I'll go ahead and explain it in class. But I would defer that to the writing in the module for the time being, okay? <clears throat> so what do we do after this loop? In other words, what does it mean after the while loop? This is something that you should always think about when you're writing code in a high level programming language is what does it mean when I get out of the loop, okay? So in this case, it's relatively easy. In order to stay in the loop, it says there is room for another multiplication by two. So what is the condition when I get out of the loop? There is a room. Exactly, I can no longer multiply by two. So that means C is the largest uh, coefficient that still fits in 64 bits in this case. Is that okay? Well, that means I'm, I'm ready for a division by 10. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and do a division by 10. So we will say at this point, C is, uh, C is as large as it can be in 64 bits. Okay, so now we can do a division by 10. So division by 10, you guys go like, oh, that has to be pretty easy. C is C divided by 10. And then we can now finally adjust you know, E10 by one by bumping it up. So once again, this math seems to be pretty easy, right? Division by 10, okay. Adding one to the exponent of 10, you know, to counteract you know, the coefficient being uh, divided by 10, that seems to make sense, okay? There's a problem here. Every single time you do an integer division, we lose something, right? So the question is, what is the error? Is the error always going to be, is the resulting value always going to be less than or greater than what it is supposed to be? Or is it sometimes less than, sometimes greater than, so they will tend to cancel out? What do you think? Always less. It's always going to be less than, okay? So when you perform, okay, let me explain what that means in terms of math. And that is also fully explained in the module, which means you're reading the module is absolutely important. Okay. All right. All right, so I'm gonna start reading from here, okay? Consider an integer division and divided by D. Because it is an integer division, the quotient is the only integer part of the actual result what is truncated is called the error, okay? Do we understand that particular paragraph, what it is trying to say? We good, okay? I can illustrate it as well, okay? So if I go back to my DOS prompt here, oh, actually, not that's not my DOS prompt. This one is my DOS prompt, there we go. It's not DOS, it is you know, Linux, but close enough. I'm kind of surprised that no one here asked me, what is DOS? What is DOS? <laughs> DOS is Disk Operating System. This is the operating system back when the entire computer runs on floppy disks. Of course, you know, that prompts another question, which is, what is a floppy disk? It is a disk that is floppy. Same hmm? Same hmm? Same what? Isn't it one of those things you can put in the <laughs> There are eight inch floppy disks, five and a quarter inch, and then finally three and a quarter, three and a half inch of floppy disks. The density of a floppy disk, if I remember correctly, with a five and a quarter inch, because I own some of those, is 180 kilobytes. So one floppy disk can store 180 kilobytes. Just kind of imagine installing Microsoft Office these days using only floppy disks. By the time you get to disk 50, you probably have to change your drive because your drive has worn out. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to use GDB to illustrate what I just said, okay? So if I were to ask what is 432 divided by 10, it tells me it's 43. If I were to ask what is 433.0 divided by 10, it tells me it's 43.2. So the integer division is missing the point two here. So my question is, is the integer division always going to lose some value, which means the result of the integer division is always less than the actual division, or is it sometimes this way and sometimes that? It's always losing, right? So that means the error has a bias. The bias is always going to a smaller value. So that means if we repeatedly do it that way, the resulting value will be significantly smaller than what it is supposed to. Is that okay? So we don't want to do it that way. We want to do rounding, okay? So what is rounding? Well, I can give you a few examples. So if I want to do rounding, um, for instance, if we look at 25 divided by 10, the integer, integer division gives me a result of two, but what should be the rounded result of this division here? It should be a three, okay? 
So how do we get to the three? I don't think round works here, we'll say, okay. That's not gonna work because there's no round function. Yep. Uh, you can add on half of whatever you're dividing by. Mm -hmm. uh, so like in this case, 25, you would add five to that because five is half of 10, mm -hmm. and then you would divide out by this. Yep. So the key to do this is to say, before we do the division, add one half, of the denominator before you divide it by the denominator, then you get three. So is this a trick that only works when it is right there you know, at 0.5? The answer is no, because you know, if it is 27, 27 divided by 10 is 2.7, which should round to three. This will give me three. What about 22? 22 divided by 10 is 2.2, which should round to just two, not three. Is this gonna give me two? The answer is yes. So this is a trick of doing rounding without using floating point number division. You basically add one half of the denominator, or I should say the divisor to the original dividend before you do the division. And if you do it that way, then sometimes it's gonna round up, sometimes it's gonna round down. In other words, even though it is still not exact, we don't have a bias anymore because we are not always rounding down. We are not always truncating. Now, sometimes it's a little bit more than what it should be. Sometimes it's a little bit less than what it should be. So this is much better compared to truncation. Is that okay? All right. So if I were to switch back to the notepad here, so that means this is not good, okay? Because this is rounding down all the time. This is truncation. So that means you know, we have to kind of fix this one by saying, uh, we will just go ahead and add one half of the divisor before we perform the actual division. Then it will also perform rounding. And there's no, math, no floating point math involved here. Everything is still using integer of, of operations. Is that okay? All right. So that will help us adjust the exponent of 10 up by one, right? But the objective is to get rid, quote unquote, get rid of E10, which means we want E10 to become zero. So how do we make that happen? But uh, everything from right before the while is all the way down inside of another loop. So we do this loop and that's good. Exactly. So we say while E10 is less than zero, do the rest. There we go. So I have given you pretty much the solution of the next homework assignment. Yep. Um, I have a question. Uh, so in the nested well, Mm -hmm. uh, would the space for another time to have to be uh, like in like the case of like the 64 unsigned, it would have to be 2 raised to the power of 64 minus 6 because whenever we add on the 5 to C, yep. it would, okay. Yep. So you have to take that into consideration because it's not really just room for another multiplication by 2 because we also have to make sure that after the multiplication by two, there's still room for the plus five here. You're correct about that. All right, but for the time being, let's just focus on, you know, how do we say there's room for another multiplication by two with the coefficient? So this has nothing to do with E2, it is just on C, okay? Just on the coefficient. How do we know that? Well, there are a few things that you should probably know before you go to try to compute your own, you know, maximum unsigned 64-bit integer. So the first thing we'll look up is standard integer dot h. And this is not gonna work because, you know, it, the thing is a domain, you know, it's the domain name because of the dot h. We'll see. Oh, it's actually smart. Because before it would actually try to say, Oh, you know, this thing dot h is not a valid domain name, but now it's actually smart enough to do something like this. So you want to look up the documentation of standard integer dot h. 
and see if there is a macro or a constant that defines to be the maximum value of a 64 bit in So how do we do this? If, if I just tell you, you know, somewhere within this document is the name of a symbol or a constant that defines the maximum value that you can represent using 64 bits. How would you proceed with this? Control F. Okay, I like that. Okay, so what do we do after Control F? What are you searching for? Max. Okay, well, that, uh, that really helps, right? So now we are looking at you know, uint max underscore t, but it doesn't seem to be specific to 64 bits, right? So now you look at this particular section here. What does it say? Limits of specified width integer type. Do you think u in 64 underscore t is a specified width integer type? What is the 64 doing? Specifying the width. Okay. So that means this may be a good section to read. Okay. So I will go ahead and scroll down and go like, mm -hmm. wow, I think we got it. Don't you think? U int blah underscore max. If somebody type into your own program, U int exactly n underscore max, I will not answer the question of why it is not compiled. And I'm not kidding you. Because what do you think n is representing? Why do you think n is high power? Probably uh, it is a it is so you're correct, but more importantly, when people use a slanted or an italic n like here and here and also here, that n is a placeholder. It is con it's conventional in the description of syntax to use italic to me, it is a placeholder, which means it is supposed to be substituted by something else. So this N is supposed to be substituted by the width specifier, which is 64. Yep. Every time this is referenced, does it kind of have this value stored already, or does it really have to recalculate it every single time you like, call it? Because otherwise, wouldn't it just, why not just do two N take away one, take away one? That is a very good question. Okay, so how do we find the answer to that question? The question is, is this macro going to recompute two to the power of N minus one, or is it you know, a constant that does not require computation time? So how do we find that out? We can write the program and see which one works faster. That we can. But there's there's a there's a much more direct way to do this. Yep. Every programmer's favorite thing to do is read documentation. Yes, RTFM is one. Read the fine manual. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So this is from a header file. Read the header file. You have taken CISP 360. You should have the basic skills to read the definitions inside a header file. This is how you can track down the definitions of how things are defined. And you might actually find you know, reading the header file to be quite educational because you know, it might illustrate things that you think you know, but you don't quite yet, okay? Because you know, it will show you all the cool things you can do with a header file. But to answer the question directly, um, you, you know, when you use macros or you, when you use a constant like this, it is a constant. You know, it does not require extra time for the computation. All right, so that's good. Okay, so we, we got one puzzle you know, solved, out, solved already. So now the question is, um, how do we formulate the, this part of the expression? So that becomes the next question, right? So I'm a, I, I will tell you what you're not supposed to do, and then I'll leave it up to you guys to try to find out what you're supposed to do. So I will tell you this is not gonna work. 
if you say, you know, if I multiply C by two uh, and it is less than um, or equal to the maximum value, and I'm not going to use the correct, you know, um, reference to the term here because we just talked about it. I think it should be up to you to find out how to specify that. But this is not going to work. Why is it not going to work? This max here is specific to the type of C, which is U in 64 and this 14. So why do you think this will never work? Let me flip the question around. And I'll just go ahead and say, this is the maximum you know, of a unsigned 64-bit integer. And then this side is a any unsigned 64-bit integer. I challenge you to find me a value that will make this false. Go ahead. Um, isn't it because once, if it was for it, it wind up multiplying by two, mm -hmm. you're checking the case. Uh, you then have an overflow error because then it goes beyond the limit and so everything. It wrap around. Yeah. It would wrap around. And therefore, this loop is an infinite loop. This loop will never exit because it is impossible to find an unsigned 64 bit integer that is less than or equal to the maximum of an unsigned 64 bit integer because that would contradict the very definition of maximum. Is that okay? So that means this is not going to work. So if this is not going to work, how are we going to do it? Once again, I think we will, I will leave it up to you guys to find the solution. You know, so I know some of you already know the solution already, but try to keep it to yourself, okay, until next class, because this is not assigned yet. So this is not quite an assignment at this point, but I think you, know, you guys could use math here to try to figure out the answer. Algebra, to be more exact, okay? Algebra, yes? Why it won't work? From the perspective of types, it's not gonna work. Because, you know, just like any other operation in C++, you have to understand what is the type of the right-hand side and what is the type of the, okay, from your perspective, left-hand side and right-hand side, right? So, C is an unsigned 64-bit integer. Two is just a regular integer. So the product of that is gonna inherit the type of the bigger one, which is the unsigned 64-bit integer. So that means the left-hand side is an unsigned 64-bit integer. The right, the right-hand side is also an unsigned 64-bit integer because max is referring to the name that refers to the maximum of a 64-bit unsigned integer. In other words, we are having a relational operator for unsigned 64-bit integer. Is that okay? But since the right-hand side is specifying the largest, the maximal value of an unsigned 64-bit integer, don't you think that value is automatically greater than or equal to anything else as a 64-bit unsigned integer? This is where the you know, computer science is different from math because a math professor will look at this and go like, I don't see a problem. A computer science person looks at it and go like, yeah, that's going to be an infinite loop. Good luck. <clears throat> it's not very often that computer science people can tell a math person and go like, yeah, I think you're missing something. <laughs> not very often, but occasionally we do have our moments. Just wait until the math people try to put a single equal as comparison. <laughs> they go like, yeah, single equal should work when it's comparison. You go like, no, this is an assignment. What do you mean by assignment? Assignment should never be able to, uh, to be allowed here inside the condition. Guess again. <laughs> uh, speaking on that note, um, mm -hmm. in 360, whenever we were uh, making uh, tic tac toe programs. Mm -hmm. uh, my program would go through, and whenever it was checking on what numbers were equal to zero or whatever the characters were um, for computer versus player, um, it would assign every single square as zero, and <laughs> as opposed to checking every single one of them. And I didn't realize that until like it came to like a couple days before turning it in, and I was like. Oh, that's a problem. 
Yep, single equal versus double equal. And this is just for C, C++, and Java. When you move on to JavaScript and some of the other scripting languages, there are triple equal operators, which are kind of like double equal, but not quite the same. To quote Keanu Reeves as John Wick in the, um, in the featurette you know, of John Wick 4, there was, there was one scene that is really, un, that, that, that sold the movie to me, okay? I'm gonna watch the movie just because of those three seconds. It is Keanu Reeves you know, using his wooden performance as usual, which is why I like him, saying, yeah, not really. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, I think it's one minute and nine seconds into the featurette. <clears throat> now you know what I do when I have spare time. <laughs> yeah, not really. <laughs> but it was very iconic. It's a very iconic moment. Um, so, anyhow, Think about this, okay? You know, I'm not going to give you the solution right out, out of the bat because I want you to think about it, okay? This is not a problem that you cannot solve. You just have to kind of think about it a little bit. And also take into consideration of this plus five here because we also want to make sure that after you multiply you know, C by two, that you don't want to exceed, you know, um, and we turn out to have to add the five here. We also want to, want to make sure the sum between C and five does not exceed the maximum. So at this point, it is all algebra, okay? It is all algebra. You just have to figure out, you know, how to go back and change the way you do the comparison so that, you know, you can successfully find out whether there's room for another multiplication by two, taking into consideration that we might need to add five, you know, after the loop exits, or we have to add five after the loop exits. All right, yep. We should prioritize adding five, right? So, because that um, makes it so that the error is not in a specific direction. Whereas, like, if we could double it, uh, which would reduce the error and not add five, which would be mm -hmm. directional, would that be better? So, what you're looking for is as long as this thing is less than max, okay. you want to keep doubling, right? Because you know, that's basically what we want to achieve is. We don't want just the room to multiply by two, but we also need to need to add five to it. So um, that would not be good. This is not good because um, when we do exit the loop, that means um, no, this is fine as long as this is yeah, this would still be okay. I think. But obviously, you know, not in this expression, you have to use algebra to make sure, okay, I'll give you a big hint, okay? Use algebra so the C is by itself on one side of the comparison. How about that? Isn't that a big enough clue? Okay. All right, so this is, you know, um, kind of the end, not quite, but it's kind of the end of the double precision floating point number um, discussion. Um, in the next 10 minutes or so, um, we, the first thing is I'm going to take row. Okay, so we'll take row first because I did prepare. There'll be a waste not to do that. And this time I did prepare the QR code as well. So, all right. So the Access code is Mantisa, M-A-N-T-I-S-S-A. -S -S and then the QR code is here. It is not released yet. So even if you scan right now, it's not gonna work. So I have to um, give it a date, a deadline, and then release it. So give me a second here. I'll give you guys till 6.50 p.m., which sounds fair enough. Save and publish. And now you should be able to use the QR code. Does that work for people all the way to the back? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, that's, 
Yeah, but that means you know, the, the camera on the phone has enough resolution. It has to have enough resolution in order for the digital zoom to work in the first place. Uh, what's the use of the huh? What's the use of the, uh, the, the passcode? No, no, I, I was talking about the answer. Oh, the answer? The answer to the one question. It, oh, true or false? True or false. You know, what is it supposed to be? Well, it depends on whether you're answering that question for yourself or for another person. <laughs> yes. Can't by design uh, your QR code can be like missing a certain percentage of, of its images still scanning. Yeah. Say that one more time. Sorry. By design, uh -huh. can't most QR codes like be missing a huge part of its yes. actual code? Yes. The QR code is uh, has to be done. Yeah. So in case you you miss certain portions of it, it, it should still work, and that portion is programmable too. So you can actually you know, specify, you know, what is the largest percentage of lost pixel that you would allow for the QR code to continue to work. So it's really quite interesting. All right, so moving ahead, we still got three more minutes and we do have a activity today. So we'll go ahead and start with that one too. So I'll give you the code to that one. I think it's just EXP in all lowercase, but I want to be sure. And this one is a lot of math stuff. It's a little bit more than last time in terms of the math stuff in it. So you might want to get your calculator ready, or you can use Google Sheets. Okay, you can use a spreadsheet for that purpose. It will work as well. And let's see. I just want to double check. I got everything set up. It is. So the um, access code is exp, all lowercase, for exponent. So there we go, right here. All righty. So I'll see you guys in the lab in a few minutes. The Oh, yeah. It's painful, yeah. but it's still not quite as painful as your Microsoft Windows session. I'm going to upgrade your operating system. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have a choice if your machine is under the administration of your of your employer. I kind of deal with that every day because I'm the guy who's pushing those on hard <laughs> 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 a different perspective. Yes, that is funny. <laughs>